Praise the Lord. We welcome you this morning. Please be seated if you would. We welcome you to Jesus Lord Outreach Center. We're glad that you are here to worship the Lord, to minister to Him and receive His Word. Praise God for what He is doing in your life. We always like to greet those that are here for the first time. This is your first time. Praise God. Raise your hands if you would. I know we have a couple over there. Praise the Lord. We welcome you. and glad that you've come to worship with us today. We're going to worship the Lord as we bring up our tithes and offerings unto Him. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for the opportunity to continue to worship you as we bring of our tithes and offerings unto you. We've laid up in stores, we've, we've prospered us this week, and we bring them unto you. We thank you that as we sow, we're going to reap. As we bring of our tithes and our offerings, we know that you open the windows of heaven. You pour out your blessings upon us. You rebuke the devourer for our sakes. Our fruit comes to pass in its season. And we thank you that you look down from your holy habitation. You are pouring out your blessings upon us. Father, we thank you and praise you for your blessings resting upon our house. And we thank you that all that you're doing as we always give joyfully, excitedly because we want to in obedience to your word. Father, we thank you that you are causing all grace to abound toward us, that we have all sufficiency in all things and may be able to abound to every good work. Father, thank you for meeting the need of every individual in this place according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, please wait on the people, if you would. Our regular service times are Sunday morning at 10, Sunday evening at 6.30, Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and we have our intercessory prayer on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. We have ministry of deliverance on Saturdays from 10.30 to 12. First, we make an appointment and then minister to you on an ongoing basis. Praise God for all that he's accomplishing in your life. He wants every one of us to be born again, receive the Holy Spirit, have a prayer language. He wants us to be healed. He wants us to be delivered. He wants to be a witness for him. He wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to become strong. He wants you to become mighty. He wants you to walk in victory and see God use you in the ministry that he's called you to. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're going to pray for all men and then pray for our nation before we get into the word. Father, we just pray for every person who's never received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Father, we continue to never forget those who, if they would die tonight and not be born again, they would not go to heaven. They would go to hell. They would be in everlasting torment. Father, we just thank you that as we pray for you, the Lord of the harvest, to send forth the laborers, we know that you're sending forth the laborers. Thank you for sending forth the laborers in the harvest field. We will be laborers ourselves and preach the gospel to others. Father, we thank you as the word is sown in their hearts. We thank you that you're bringing the revelation of Jesus Christ. Thank you for opening the eyes of their understanding, bringing them to repentance. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for convicting them of the sin of not believing on Jesus. And Father, we thank you for the multitudes receiving Jesus. Father, also thank you for reaching the backslider. Thank you for reaching, reaching the one who's lukewarm because your word says the lukewarm are going to be spewed out of your mouth. Thank you for bringing them to repentance that they would be hot for you. That they would be zealous and repent and get right with you. Father, we thank you and we praise you for all you're doing to bring forth a great harvest of souls in these last days. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, we also pray for our nation. We thank you that this is one nation under God regardless of what other leaders want to say. We thank you that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We know that blessings only come when Jesus is Lord over this nation. We know that righteousness is what exalts a nation. Father, we thank you for bringing forth righteousness in this nation. We bind all the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. We cast them down and throw them down. We bind all the spirits from witchcraft and sorcery and all those ones who have been used of the enemy to bring forth evil things into this nation. We bind all the spirits of lawlessness, the spirits of unrighteousness, the spirits of hatred and violence and racial prejudice. We bind all these spirits of fornication and adultery. We bind all these spirits of cohabitation, living together in adultery that are working. We bind all these spirits of the homosexuality and all the lies, the lying, deceiving spirits. 
gay marriage, all these things. We bind every one of them. We loose their hold. We cast them down and throw them down and fall upon them to their destruction. Father, we just thank you for doing whatever's necessary to bring this nation to repentance. Thank you for bringing the fear of God upon this nation. Thank you for bringing it to the place of repentance. Thank you for shaking this nation. Thank you for raising, raising up righteous leaders. We thank you for those ones that are ungodly. Thank you for sending labors to them. Thank you for visiting them and dealing with them to come to the place of repentance. If they will not listen to you, thank you for removing them from office. Father, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Thank you for dealing with all these judges that th keep throwing out the laws made by the people. Father, thank you for bringing these ones to the place of repentance. There would be judicial activists that are ruling according to political preference instead of according to your word in what, the way of the Constitution, what has been set forth in this nation. Father, we thank you for working mightily to do what's necessary. Thank you for awakening the body of Christ out of its slumber, that it would preach the gospel and stand up for righteousness. Father, thank you for bringing forth a restoration. Now, Father, we continue to thank you that as we stand in the gap, remitting the sins and iniquities of this nation from its founding to this moment, we thank you that we are your people called by your name who do humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. We know that you hear from heaven. We know that you forgive us our sins. We know that you're healing our land. Thank you for doing it and accomplishing your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God for what he is doing. Hallelujah. Stand with me if you would. We're going to pray as we get into God's word this morning. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We do receive your word written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will take hold of it, be hearers and doers of it, and we know it will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're going to talk to you today on the subject of the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is critical for every Christian to get a hold of. We have a great problem in the body of Christ because there have been doctrines of devils that have gone forth. There has been that taught which is contrary to the Word of God that has been deceiving the multitudes and leading them down a wrong path. And the church needs to be retaught the knowledge of God because they have not been taught the truth as we have seen in so many different areas. So what's the answer? We've got to get the knowledge of God. And how do we get the knowledge? It is from God through His Word. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Talk no more so exceedingly proudly, yet not arrogance, let not arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. He is a God of knowledge. A God of knowledge wants you to have knowledge, and He wants to bring knowledge to every single one of us. And notice, by Him, actions are weighed. All of our actions are going to be weighed, determined, is this in line with the knowledge of God? Is this in line with the ways of the Lord or not? We need the knowledge of God, the true knowledge of God. In Proverbs chapter 19, we see in verse 2, it says also that the soul be without knowledge, it is not good. If we don't have the knowledge of God, God said it's not good because we won't know his ways. And if we don't have the knowledge of God in a soulless realm, which is our mind, will, emotions, we won't be choosing the way of the Lord. We'll be thinking wrong. We'll be choosing wrong. We'll have wrong priorities and, and focuses in our life instead of having the word of God. We need the knowledge of God. We also see there's many that don't even want to hear the knowledge of God today. In Job chapter 21, we see in verse 14, Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us. We desire not the knowledge of thy ways. There's many out there that don't even want to hear the word of God. We should always be ready to hear the word of God and get the knowledge of God, get the knowledge of his ways. It is absolutely essential. If we don't have the knowledge of God, are we going to be not accountable for it? No. In Leviticus chapter 5, we see over here in verse 17, the Bible says, if a soul sin, 
and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord. Though the King James says, though he wist it not, this word wist actually means to know. It's just an old English word for know. Though he knows it not, yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity. In other words, if we don't know something, does that mean we're not accountable for it? No, we are accountable because we've entered into covenant relationship with God when we receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, and we are responsible to know the word of the covenant that we've come into. So if we do things contrary to the word, we are guilty, and we are going to bear our iniquity, because regardless of whether you know it, Satan's going to accuse you of your sins, giving him a right to bring his destructive works against you in your life. If we don't get his word in us, we must understand that that is what is going to judge everybody in the earth. In John chapter 12, down in verse 48, the Bible says, He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, has one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. What's the judge? The word of God. So what do we need to know? We've got to know the Word of God. We've got to get the knowledge of the Word of God. We see over in Hosea. In Hosea chapter 4, there was a problem. He said, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there's no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. There was a lack of truth, a lack of mercy, a lack of the knowledge of God in the land. Now, why was that? Because it wasn't available? No. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people were destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, why didn't they have knowledge? Because thou hast rejected knowledge. They rejected the knowledge of God that came to them. We can't be rejecting the knowledge of God. We want to receive the knowledge of God and act upon it and do what it says. Notice what he says, you reject the knowledge of God, and God's a God of knowledge, I'll reject you. It's essentially rejecting God. We've got to get his knowledge, exactly what it says, in line with the word of God. He says, thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God, I'll also forget thy children. That shows you that God would treat them exactly how they treated him. God wants us to get the knowledge of God. We also see in Isaiah, Isaiah, Chapter 5, over in verse 13. He says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. We need the knowledge of God so we know what to do so we can see God's victory and freedom and liberty come forth in our life. If we don't have the knowledge of God, the enemy will work against us because we'll end up walking in the flesh, we'll walk in sin, and we won't be able to resist his attacks that come against us and we'll end up going into captivity. God does not want us in captivity. He wants us to come out of all captivity and walk in victory. We must get the knowledge of God. It is absolutely essential. Well, we're going to get the knowledge of God because the Word of God is the revelation of the knowledge of God that will be revealed by the Holy Spirit and gets written in our heart and mind as we hear it. In Isaiah chapter 11, it speaks of, about Jesus, as it's talking about. It says here in verse 1, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. That's talking about Jesus as the branch. This is what it's a type of, pointing towards. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. These are the things that were upon Jesus, one of those being the spirit of knowledge. And now you and I receive Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Savior, and we want to receive everything that Jesus has to bring forth to us. And he's going to bring the knowledge of God to us. Remember in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2, it says, God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's the way he spoke in the Old Testament. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, through the word of the New Testament. He's appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So he's spoken by his Son, and now we need to get the word of God in us and understand it from the New Testament standpoint, all the things that he tells us to do, 
and he's going to, we're going to get the knowledge of God and we're going to walk in the ways of the Lord. It is important that we have the fear of God before us. That is essential. In Proverbs chapter 1, in verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is understanding that God is a God who performs his word. When you obey, you'll be blessed. When you disobey, curses will come upon you. You do what he says, he'll bring good things. You don't do what he says, evil things are going to come. That should have the fear of God, that we've got to choose the way of the Lord. That's the beginning of knowledge, because we realize I must get the knowledge of God so I know God's ways, so I walk in his ways and see his blessings instead of seeing curses or evil destructive things come upon me in my life. We see that there was a problem they had. Proverbs 1.29, For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. We should love the knowledge of God. We should never hate knowledge or be resistant against it. We want to receive the knowledge of God. In Proverbs chapter 2, he says in verse 1, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. We hide them in our heart so we don't sin against God, remember. We receive his word as we hear it. So that thou shalt incline thine ear into wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifted up thy voice for understanding. We're going to seek after these things. We're going to pray for God to bring forth revelation, knowledge, and understanding. If you seek for her as silver and search for her as for hid treasures, then you're going to understand the fear of the Lord and you're going to find the knowledge of God. It has to be sought after. It is going to come to us as we seek him. He will reveal his ways unto us. As you get the word of God and he brings knowledge to you, revelation knowledge of his ways, it speaks here about, in Proverbs 2.10, how wisdom enters into the heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Your soul is made up of the will, intellect, and emotions. As we get the Word of God in us, knowledge, remember the Word is written in two places. It's written in our heart, and it's also written in our mind. In our heart it produces faith, in our mind it produces hope. And that's the area that is to be the hope is to be the anchor of the soul. So the Word in our mind is going to stabilize our soul so that we will choose the way of the Lord. We see over in Proverbs chapter 22, over here in verse 17. He says, Bow down mine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. We've got to be hearing and applying our heart that we're going to hear what he says, we're going to take hold what he says, we're going to do what he says. We want this to be in what we're going to walk after. And as we take the word of God, get the knowledge of God, we realize we're going to walk in his ways and we're not going to walk after the ways of the world. Remember, the God of this world is the devil. And he leads people down a path contrary to the truth. In Nehemiah 8.10, it speaks about here, about how the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, singers, Nethanims, all they that had separated themselves from the people of the land. Why? They separated themselves from the people of the land unto the law of God, unto the word. The wives, sons, and daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding. As you get the knowledge of God, you'll be separated unto God, because he's a God of knowledge. And you'll be separate from the things of this world and that which is not of the Lord. God wants us to walk in his ways. Now, how are we going to be able to do this? Well, we've got to hear the word of God, don't we? We see a scripture over in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, we see it in chapter 12. Ecclesiastes, chapter 12. Down over here in verse 9. Something that's important. Something that I saw more than 30 years ago, about 34 years ago, when I first began in ministry. As I began in ministry, I saw all the different teachings on all these different subjects out there. And I saw that someone taught this, someone taught that. They were different. There was, con there was certainly not some uniform teaching across the board on all kinds of subjects in the body of Christ. So I saw what do I need to do? What do I need to do? The Lord told me that I was to approach every subject as if I knew nothing. That's the key. Then you're open to revelation. If you approach it through your preconceived notions, 
you'll always see it from that viewpoint instead of being open to revelation. And so if you, always, if you have your rose-colored glasses on, everything's going to have a rose tint to it. You need to instead see it as if you know nothing. Then you're open for revelation. And he said also that you have to study every scripture. You can't just study a few of them. Take some, oh, some good scriptures, favorite scriptures. You know, this seems like a good one people like to hear. Or a few good ones on the subject. No, you've got to look at them all. You've got to look at all the scriptures, because all the scriptures are truths and find out what every scripture says and look up the words and be sure that you understand what's being said. Look what it says in Ecclesiastes 12, 9. Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. I saw the scripture, I thought, well, I'm going to be wise because I realize that I'm going to be in trouble if I don't do what's right. In fact, we'll come back here for a moment. Because the Bible talks about, over in James, chapter 3, about brethren, be not many masters, which means teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The te teachers are going to receive the greater judgment if they are not teaching right. And I don't want to stand before the Lord and see, well, you're going to get judged because you didn't teach things accurately in line with the word. So because the preacher was wise, what's he going to do? He's going to teach the people knowledge. That was one thing. How do I minister? I need to minister knowledge to people. People need to get knowledge because that's what they need. Yea, he gave good heed. The preacher gave good heed, and what did he do? He sought out and set in order many proverbs, which are all the scriptural truths. Every scripture is a truth. So you've got to take out, take much time to seek out and set in order the many Proverbs. You can't just look at a few and then leave others out. And you also got to look at every scripture and find out if the words are translated correctly, as we pointed out time and time again where there are errors. Also, you got to look at the tense and the voice and the mood to find out what is exactly being said, as the Greek, which the New Testament, is very specific about what is said. And look, looking at these things to understand, especially in the New Testament, what all it, the word is telling us. So he sought out and set in order the many Proverbs. And so, well then what do I need to bring forth? In Bible schools, they teach you to take a text, a scripture or two, maybe three, you know, give your text, have your points, such and such, have your little illustrations, little jokes, tell some funny things, you know, make sure you're kind of entertaining a little bit, and just bring out your point. That's what they teach you. Well, I saw this, and I saw that's wrong. The Bible doesn't say to do that. We don't go around talking stories and jokes and all this stuff. What do people need to hear? The knowledge of God, the Word of God. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. What words are acceptable? Well, I want to be sure I'm speaking the right kind of things. That which was written was upright, even words of truth. So what's acceptable for the preacher to bring forth? The words of truth. So from that point on, I saw that I was to bring forth scripture upon scripture upon scripture as they've been set in order to bring forth knowledge and revelation of the truth. That is what needs to be done. That's what happened. It absolutely showed me how to minister truth to people. Yet, what's happened in the body of Christ? Do you see people doing that out there? No. They're following the way they've been taught in the Bible schools, which are totally contrary to the Word, or following what so-and-so does. No, we should be teaching the Word. And we've got to look at every scripture. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. He goes on and says, for precept... The word precept means command. Up, must be upon precept or command. Precept upon precept. Line, which refers to like rule, the rule, measuring line like a rule. Rule upon rule. Here a little, there a little. Precept upon precept, command upon command, line upon line, or scripture after scripture, rule after rule. Otherwise, it's going to be little by little by little. Scripture after scripture after scripture. There's no shortcut to growing up. 
That's how we're going to get knowledge. That's how we're going to understand doctrine. That's how we're going to grow up, because the one who's weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast is someone who's growing up. And we've been talking about growing up spiritually. That's why we're bringing this message. It's essential to have the knowledge of God if you're going to grow up spiritually in your life. We see in Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15. He said, I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. I saw that scripture. I want to be a pastor according to God's heart. I don't want to be one that's just according to whatever I want to be. So I'm going to feed knowledge and understanding. That's what God wants for every one of us. So we bring forth a scripture, scripture after scripture, so we get the knowledge of God and we gain spiritual understanding. Getting the knowledge of God is absolutely essential. He's a God of knowledge and we must get it for good doctrine so that we know the way of the Lord so we will walk in His ways. Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, not only the beginning of knowledge, but also the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. We've got to get knowledge of the holy things of God that He considers holy and do the things that He says. Very important that we walk in His ways. There's a way of holiness for every one of us to walk in, the redeemed to walk therein. Proverbs 10, verse 14. Wise men lay up knowledge. They store up or lay up. This means to store up knowledge. That's what we need to do. We need to be storing up knowledge. And where is it being stored up? In our heart, in our mind, through the Word of God. And we also keep ourselves organized by having the Scriptures so we can refer to them as we have notebooks and have Scriptures lined up, teachings and all these different things that are so important. Wise men are going to store up knowledge. Through knowledge, God's going to deliver you as you act upon His Word. Proverbs 11 verse 9 says, A hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge the just shall be delivered. Those are the righteous. Through the knowledge of God, knowing what the Word says is going to bring forth deliverance. If you don't know that God is the healer of all sickness and disease, will you know that He will heal you? No, you'll just think that, well, I guess I'm just supposed to have this problem like everybody else out there in the world. If you don't know that you have authority over all the power of the enemy, will you use your authority and conquer the power of the enemy? No, you won't get delivered from the enemy's works against you. We've got to have knowledge of what he says and put it in operation to see the results come forth of what God purposes. In Proverbs chapter 14, we see in verse 7, Go from the presence of a foolish man, when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. What does God say? He's saying if someone doesn't have knowledge in his lips, God actually called that person a foolish man. I don't want to be a foolish man, be speaking things that are contrary to the Word. That's why we've got to have the knowledge of God. We've got to be sure what's coming out of our mouth is in line with the Word. Otherwise, from God's perspective, we'd be considered a foolish man. We don't want to be foolish. We want to be doing what's right. Proverbs 15, verse 2. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright, because knowledge is given to you that you can use it by acting upon it and doing what it says so it will produce results in your life. God wants you to apply the knowledge of God in your life to see the promises come forth. Your tongue of the wise, that means your mouth is important. In fact, we even see in Proverbs 5, 2, he says the latter part, that thy lips may keep knowledge. God wants your lips to keep knowledge. He wants your mouth to always be speaking forth things that are in line with his word. In fact, it's interesting. In Proverbs chapter 15, 20, verse 15, there is gold in a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Knowledge that's coming out of your mouth, God considers it like a precious jewel. It's important because it's really, why? Because when you speak His Word, He's going to perform it. That's releasing Him because He is the Word. How do you see God do things? You speak and or act upon His Word, the knowledge of God, and that puts Him in operation to do the things that He says and bring it forth. So if we're going to be wise, we're going to have the knowledge of God. We're going to 
put it in operation, we're also going to give it out to others as well because we're to help other people have knowledge. Proverbs 15, verse 7, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge. You are to be a knowledge dispenser. You are dispersing knowledge of the Word of God wherever you go to help people learn the knowledge of God so they can know God and walk in His ways. Also, because the knowledge of God is so important, when you have the knowledge of God, you'll learn and you realize, hey, I can only be speaking God's Word. If I'm not speaking the right things, I'll be considered a foolish man and I'll be uh, maybe a vessel of the devil instead of a vessel of what God wants. Well, Proverbs 17, 27 says, He that has knowledge spares his words. That's right. We watch what words we speak. We don't just go off on them in the mouth, you know. We want to watch our words because words are important. They are powerful. So, we're gonna, of course, we understand. We're going to speak right things. Praise God. Now, in Proverbs chapter 24, speaking about knowledge, we see in verse 4, by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. The riches of Christ that we now are to possess in the New Testament will come forth in your life through the knowledge of God. You're going to possess all these things that God has for you. A wise man is strong. We talked about it, just brought a message recently on how we're to be spiritually strong in order to conquer the enemy. A man of knowledge increases strength. You want to increase strength? Be a person of knowledge. A man of knowledge is going to increase strength. As the Word of God is going to bring the power of God within you, and you're going to put it in operation, and you're going to increase strength in your life. We see down in verse 14. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. When thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward. We're going to get rewarded, see? when we put the knowledge, the knowledge of wisdom into operation. And your expectation shall not be cut off. Otherwise, you know what God's going to do because you know His Word is what He's going to perform. You know His Word is the truth. Your expectation, which is of the promises of God coming to pass and God accomplishing His Word in our life. Therefore, what should we be doing? Well, Proverbs 14, or 15, verse 14, 15, verse 14 says, The heart of him that has understanding seeketh knowledge. God wants you to seek after knowledge. How are we going to seek knowledge? What's the source of knowledge? The Word. That's why you're going to hear the Word. That's why it's so important for you to hear the Word all the time so that then you're going to get the knowledge of God. We see over in Isaiah chapter 33. In Isaiah 33 we see over here in verse 6, Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and the strength of salvation. That's pretty important. I want to see stability come in my life and also strength of salvation. It's going to come through wisdom and knowledge. You can't do it yourself. You can't manufacture anything yourself. It's all God doing the work in you through the knowledge of God, the Word of God. The fear of the Lord is to be our treasure. Without knowledge, we're going to have all kinds of problems. We're going to walk in the flesh. We're going to walk in sin. We're going to be influenced by the things of this world. We're not going to know what God's going to do. We're not going to put Him in operation. We're just going to see all these things just happen in our life. We're seeing all destructive things. That's not what God wants. Romans chapter 10, over here in verse 2. Speaking about the Jews, notice what it says. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. They didn't do things according to the Word. There's lots of people who have a zeal of God out there, and you look like, oh, this must be great. They have a re they're really zealous. But if it's not according to knowledge, it's not doing anything. It's worthless. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God which is revealed where? In the Word, through the knowledge of God. That's how we find out the ways of righteousness. What else also happens if we do not get the knowledge of God? You know, we're supposed to have the knowledge of God, and that includes everything in His Word, and that includes knowledge about the devil. 
You know, some pastors say, I'm not going to teach anything about the devil. We're just going to talk about God. We don't talk about the devil here. I've heard lots and lots of people testify that's what their pastors have said. Is that wise? No. Notice it says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. If we're ignorant of how Satan works, what's going to happen? He's going to get an advantage of us. God wants us to understand our enemy and how he works, so we don't give place to him, and so we can conquer him. If we don't talk about the scriptures, Jesus talked about the devil, well, why wouldn't we want to talk about the scriptures about the devil so we can learn how to overcome and conquer him in our life? It's very important that we learn all of the Word of God. We can't just play pick and choose. We see so many churches, so many people out there today that are seeker-sensitive. They're going to teach the people what they'd like to hear, but they won't talk about things that they wouldn't want to hear because they might not want to come anymore. They might not, oh, and then it won't be finances coming in. What are people doing that are thinking that way? They're building their own kingdom. They're building their own thing instead of building what God wants. God says we're not to hold anything back that's profitable and we're to preach the whole counsel of God, everything. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, it speaks of those who are having their understanding or their mind, or the faculty of understanding, darkened, being alienated from the life of God now, why are they alienated from the life of God? Because of being ignorant. Because of the ignorance, which means a lack of knowledge. This word means a lack of knowledge in the Greek. They have a lack of knowledge in them because of the blindness here of their heart. Well, we've got to have our heart opened up. Some people don't have their heart opened up to receive truth. We believe such a way, that's the way it is. Don't talk to me about anything. I've even heard some ministers out there say, don't even try to correct me. I don't want to hear it. It's astounding, right? It's amazing. There's a problem. We should be willing to hear what people bring forth. We, cannot, we must get the Word of God in us. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance. If we're ignorant of the ways of the word, we're going to follow the lusts of the flesh. Man, we're not going to see God bring forth his promises in our life. What are we to be? Obedient children to what? His word, when we gain the knowledge of God. God wants us to be obedient. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Again, ignorance, this word for not knowing, of foolish men. God considers those people who don't know the word of God, don't have knowledge, as foolish men. Again, I saw these scriptures. I said, boy, I can't be foolish. I don't want to ever God to think that I'm foolish. I've got to get the word in me. I've got to get the exact knowledge of God. I've got to spend time and get in the Word of God. It is absolutely essential. It's very important. So we need to get the knowledge of God. Exactly. And that's what God expects. Over in Luke chapter 1 in verse 3. Here in Luke's account he says, it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding. This word perfect is a word which means exactly and accurately. Exactly and accurately. Having had this understanding, now the perfect understanding means ex ac accurate, exact understanding. And then he says here about following after is what this word really means. How he was following, having, as Young's brings out, having followed from the first all the things exactly. That's literally what, it, what he's saying here. Having had this exact inaccuracy of all things that I'm following after, essentially, from the very first, 
to write into the in order most excellent Theophilus. Otherwise, we wanted to be sure he's writing things exactly, ex accurately. We can't have mistakes. We've got to do things in line with the Word. If the person on your job says, you do this, and then A, B, C, D, and E, and then we'll get our, our product produced, and you don't do it accurately, and you mess up, it's not going to get produced right. You can't afford to not do things right. God expects us to do things accurately in line with His Word, which is the truth. That's why we've got to get the Word in us and you see revelation knowledge come forth. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 34, he says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. What's that tell you? If we're walking in sin, we don't have the knowledge of God, because we shouldn't be walking in sin. If we awake to righteousness, which is the way of the Lord, getting the knowledge of the way of righteousness, and we walk in it, we won't sin anymore. And he says, I speak this to your shame. He's speaking this to the Corinthian church. Corinthian church, I speak this to your same shame because you, are, have, you haven't awakened to righteousness. Remember, they had all kinds of sin problems in the church at Corinth. And he said, you guys don't have the knowledge of God. You need to awake to righteousness and not sin, but to walk in the ways of the Lord. <coughs> Romans chapter 15. Verse 14, he says, I, I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness and filled with all knowledge. Filled with all knowledge. That's what God wants. That's why you and I need to know this word. You need to know this word better than you know anything else. Because this is what you and I live by. This is what you and I are going to be judged according to. This is what's going to determine what God's going to be able to accomplish in your life. This is going to show whether you're walking in the way of the Lord or not. And that's essential. That's what, what, he, what you do with His Word is what God's going to know about you, whether you're following His ways or not, see. We also see that it's important to get the knowledge of God so we know His ways, but also 2 Corinthians 10.5 we got to be ready to deal with any things that come into our mind that are contrary to the Word so it doesn't get us off track. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 10.5. Casting down imaginations or reasonings and every high thing that exalts itself or is raising itself against the knowledge of God. In other words, anything that is coming into your mind that is against the knowledge of God or trying to raise itself in importance over the knowledge of God so you'll li listen to it and submit to it. We're making a mistake. We've we got to cast that down. We cannot let that come into our mind. It's going to affect us. And remember, that's a gate into your heart through your mind. What are we to do? We're to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. When we have the knowledge of God, every thought has to be brought into the obedience of Christ. We cannot allow evil thoughts to come into us. If you have evil thoughts come into it, you should be casting them down and bringing them captive in line with the Word immediately and not giving place to it. If it's not in line with the Word, you need to do something with it, not just allow it just to stay there and keep working you over. <coughs> in fact, it says having a readiness. The word readiness means to be prepared and ready. Being prepared and ready to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We're going to avenge or avenge all the disobedience. That means the disobedience, that's the devil attacking us with those thoughts, those negative things in our mind. That's disobedience trying to get a hold of us. We're not going to allow dis disobedience to come into us. We're going to be obedient. So we're going to re be ready to deal with those attacks. And how, are you gonna, how is it going to be shown when your obedience is fulfilled? your obedience to casting down the imagination, your obedience to taking, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What God is wanting to bring forth in this day and what He is going to do before Jesus comes back because He is going to present to Himself a glorious church. 
a remnant who are going to be without spot, without wrinkle, holy, and without blemish before him. Which means the knowledge of God is going to come into the church and the church is going to come clean up and deal with all areas of sin and walk in the ways of righteousness and, and see God accomplish everything in their life so they become holy and the glory of God will be poured out upon it. How's he going to do this? Ephesians 4.11 says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists and pastors and teachers. Fivefold ministry gifts that he gives. What's their purpose? For the perfecting of the saints. And we've talked about the perfecting of the body of Christ and how we grow up and go on into perfection. What's the purpose for the perfecting of the saints? For the work of the ministry. Who does the work of the ministry? All the saints. Not just the one, the fivefold ministry people. No. They do it too, but everybody does it. For the edifying of the body of Christ. The body of Christ has to be built up. It shouldn't be being torn down. It should be being built up through the Word of God. How long is this? Till we all come in the unity of the faith. What is the unity we're supposed to come into? The unity of the faith. How about the ecumenical teaching out there that says, well, we should all just be in one accord and love each other and be in unity and because we all believe in Jesus and that's all we need to be in unity of. That's a lying teaching. No, we're to come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. This word knowledge is a very interesting word. It's the word epigenosis, which means precise, correct knowledge. Jesus is going to have a church that's going to come to the unity of the faith and the precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God. And they're going to grow up unto the perfect man, the perfect man in Christ under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You don't see it at all today, but it's going to come forth before the end comes. Because Jesus is going to raise up a mighty church in these last days. Remember, it's going to be a glorious church that's going to be presented unto Him. So that means we've got to get the knowledge of God through the Word. Philippians chapter 3, over in verse 8. Paul says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. <coughs> now remember, Paul was one, as he talks back here, in verse 6, concerning zeal, he was persecuting the church wrongly, but touching righteousness, which is in the law, he was blameless. This guy was walking in the law blameless perfectly. He had to lose everything because that was all under the Old Testament, which were all physical types and shadows pointing to the spiritual realities, which are in the realm of the Spirit. He was doing all the things in the natural, the physical ordinances, but they all change. They're all pointing towards the reality of the work that Jesus brings forth. He says, I count all these things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. I've suffered the loss of all things. I count them as dung, that I may win Christ. That's what he's going, he says, I'm going to win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is the law. It could never produce righteousness. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of faith of God by faith, that I may know him. See, God wants you to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with the Lord. It's not just having a bunch of facts about Him. He is the Word, and as you know the Word, you're going to know Him. You're going to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with Him. You're going to know the way He thinks. You're going to know His ways. You're going to know the things He will do. You're going to know Him. You're going to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with the Lord. And you're going to know the power of His resurrection at work, because the power of God works through the Word of God. And the fellowship of His sufferings, because... Yeah, you're going to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. You know, remember, the, the, the servant's not above his master, remember? No, we're going to have the persecution. All those that live godly will suffer persecution, being made conformable unto his death. So he goes on and says, If by any means I might attain or have arrived at, under the resurrection of the dead, so I can arrive at this point, I want to get there, is what he's saying. Not as though I've already attained or already taken, this, taken hold of this, Either we're already perfect. He said, I haven't come to perfection yet. 
but I'm following after. And this word here in the Greek means to run after, to run, to run swiftly in order to catch something. I am running after. If that I may apprehend or I may lay hold of, this particular Greek word means. It's a word katalambana, which means to lay hold of. That I may lay hold of that for which also I am laid hold of, of Christ Jesus. He has redeemed us and purchased us, brought us out of bondage. Now we can run that race and take hold of all that he has for us. So his brethren, I do not count myself to have, have arrived or laid hold of it. But if one thing I do, I'm forgetting the things that are behind and I'm reaching forth to those things which are before. He's running the race for everything that God has. And he's going to get it through the knowledge of God, the excellency of the knowledge. That's why he says, I press. It's the same word. It means to run. I am running swiftly toward the mark for the prize. That's the award to the victor because you have to conquer the enemy. You have to conquer the devil and see the promises of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The knowledge of God. He realized how important this was. Colossians chapter 1, verse 5. He says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, which you've heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it does in you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. So the word is coming to us and it was bringing forth fruit as he says, and he says, this is this word of truth of the gospel, this hope that's laid up for me in heaven. I'm going to get this gospel into me. And then he comes down to verse 9, and he says, For this cause also, so the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, as he's praying for them, but that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He's praying for the church at Colossae. You and I are to be filled with the knowledge of his will. It means you can know his will. Anybody that says you can't know the will, that's ridiculous. We're supposed to be filled with the knowledge of his will. What's his will? His word. His will is his word. What he says in his word is his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And so we can walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing. So we can be fruitful in every good work. So we can be, in, and we're to be increasing in the knowledge of God. God wants to be increasing. The more we get the knowledge of God, the more we're going to know God's ways. We're going to be empowered or strengthened with all might or empowered with all power. It's the same word. It's the word dunamo and dunamis. They mean power, literally, in the Greek. According to his glorious power and all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Otherwise, the power of God is going to be resident in you. It's going to be manifesting out of you. You're going to be steadfast and long-suffering in every situation. This is why we've got to get the knowledge of God. Colossians 2.2 says that their hearts might be comfort, comforted, being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the, the King James says, acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. But really this is the same word, epigenosis, which means the knowledge, the precise and correct knowledge, or as Young's brings out, the full knowledge, precise, correct knowledge of the mystery of God. It's not acknowledging it, it's getting the full knowledge. Acknowledgement means I'm just like acknowledging that it's so. Yeah, that's not what it says. It says literally that you are com coming to the precise and correct knowledge of the mystery of God. God wants us to get that understanding so we know the ways of the Lord. So what are we going to do? We do have to get rid of these negative things and put off the old man, as it says back in Colossians 3.8. We're going to put off all these, the anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, this precise, correct knowledge. In the measure that you have the knowledge renewed in you is the measure that you are putting on the new man. And this word put on is a word enduo in the Greek, which means to sink into clothing. It's like putting on spiritual clothes. As you get the knowledge of God, you're putting on spiritual clothes in you, putting on the new man. And it's interesting that you're the one who's responsible to do this, because this happens to be a middle voice verb. 
It's important to understand tense, voice, and mood of verbs and here for the first time. We explain these things as we go. There's three voices in the Greek. There's an active voice, which means the subject's doing the action. There is a passive voice, which means the subject is acted upon by somebody else. There is a middle voice, which means the subject is doing the action for his benefit. So, you and I are to put on, we're responsible to do it, for our own benefit, the new man. Otherwise, God's not going to do it for you. You're going to do it for yourself. How? By being renewed in knowledge, the precise, correct knowledge of God. That means you and I need to get the Word in us and we're responsible to get our mind renewed to the truth of God's Word and the Holy Spirit will reveal the truth to us. We saw, I, I prayed to the church at Colossians, he did the same thing at Ephesians. The church at Ephesus, he was praying for them in Ephesians 1.16, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. He's going to bring wisdom and revelation, revealed knowledge, revelation in the precise, correct knowledge of Him. That's why, see, you're, you're not just knowing about Him, you're knowing Him. It's the knowledge of Him. You're going to know the way of the Lord. You're going to know Him and be able to walk in His ways. Everybody is supposed to get this knowledge. In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 2 over in verse 4 it says, this is the will of God, that all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge, the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. Every one of us. So don't think that, well, that's just for certain people out there. Well, I don't know if I have time to do that. Well, we need to put our priorities in order. If you don't have time to get the knowledge of God, what are you doing with your time? Well, I'm busy with doing all these other things. Well, can you listen to a tape while you're doing things? washing the dishes, folding the clothes, driving the car, doing something. Sure you can. Can you redeem your time and use a lot of your time to get the Word in you? Absolutely. Well, I do like to watch the TV once in a while and watch a lot of those programs out there. Well, they're just filling you up with a bunch of garbage. What do you want to watch on TV that's going to minister the things of God to you? It's going to show you the way of the flesh. It's going to show you how to do all the things that the world does. It's going to contaminate you. We want to take heed of what we hear and what we see, not set any wicked thing before our eyes. We don't want to learn about how to get angry, how to manipulate, how to be upset, how to be hurt, how to be wounded, how, you know, all these things. No. We want to hear the Word. we got time. We just need to put ourselves in the position to hear. God wants us to come to that place of hearing the Word of God. It's absolutely essential. 1 Timothy 4.1, The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. These are deceiving spirits. And what? Doctrines of devils. Doctrines of devils. That means the devil has doctrines. Well, I didn't know he had doctrines. What are his doctrines? Anything that's contrary to the truth. He likes to bring doctrines into the church. And obviously, since we see so many different teachings out there, we know there's a whole lot of doctrines of the devil in there, because there's only one truth. So we got a problem. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, even such as, here's examples, forbidding to marry, abstaining from meats, God's created to be received with thanksgiving to them that believe and know the truth. All kinds of different things that people bring forth that are contrary. God wants us to know the truth. The Word is the truth, and so we're not going to follow any of these doctrines of the devil that are contrary to the Word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and be patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, again, this is another place where they put like a verb in here, acknowledging. It's not a, it's a noun in the Greek. And it's the word epigenosis again, precise, correct knowledge. Give them repentance 
to the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. Otherwise, if you come in line with a precise, correct knowledge of the truth, then that'll show true repentance. And you'll have shown the fact that you have come to repentance because you can't repent and do it your own way. You've got to do it God's way. And notice, it's important because then they can recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, took them captive at his will. How did the devil was able to take them captive? Because he wasn't walking in the knowledge of God. That's why we've got to be sure we're walking in the knowledge of God. Otherwise, the devil's going to take us captive left and right. You know, there's ones out there that the Bible even talks about in the last days that perilous times are going to come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, pr proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, without self-control, that means, fierce, and despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Sounds like the world, doesn't it? But you know what? This isn't talking just about the world. This is talking about the church. Because it says they have a form of godliness. They got a form of godliness. Well, we're godly. But denying the power thereof. Anybody that denies the power thereof has a form of godliness that's not right. God's word is a God of as a word of power that will bring forth promises. He says, from such turn away. That's why you don't want to be around anybody that's denying the power of God. And he goes on and talks about ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, the precise correct, precise, correct knowledge of the truth. Why? Because if you, don't, you deny the power of God and you deny the truth of God's word, you don't do what he says, follow what he does, says what he's, uh, do what he's supposed to do, you're never going to come to that. These guys were ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge truth because you've got to do the word to come to the truth. See? Say, so what's, what's that all about? John chapter 3, verse 21 says, He that doeth truth cometh to the light. In other words, You've got to be a doer of the word before you're really going to come to the light. You get a, you get a certain amount of knowledge from hearing it, but you've got to do it to bring forth truth in your life. And also, what's going to happen? As you do the truth, we're doing the word, you're going to become a true disciple, which is one who's a hearer and a doer of the word. And what's going to happen? Then that truth's going to make you free. Otherwise, you'll never come to the knowledge of the truth, which is going to produce freedom. Because look what it says in John 8, 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews that believe on him, If you continue in my word, you abide, remain. This is what you're walking by. Then are you my disciples indeed. What's a disciple? A disciplined one. One who's walking in line with the word. He's hearing and doing it consistently. What's going to happen to that guy? You're going to know the truth. That tells you that knowing the truth doesn't happen just because you heard it. Knowing the truth happens because you continue in the word and become a disciplined one. And then what's that truth going to do? It's going to make you free. So how could these guys never come to the knowledge of the truth? If they came to the knowledge of the truth, they'd have been free. But if they're denying the power of God, that's for sure they're never going to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's the power of God that produces freedom. Therefore, we got to know the power of God. we got to know the truth, and we got to do the truth. If we don't do the word, we'll never see ourselves come to the victory. We've got to be doing what he says. Now, we also see that we got to put our faith in operation. In Philemon, verse 6, that the communication or participation or the fellowship of your faith may become effectual or active. I want my faith to be active. In, this is a word means in or by, but it means in here. And not acknowledging again. This is again, they brought up this word as a verb, but it's a mistake. It's the word epigenosis, which is of noun, precise and correct knowledge of every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. So he's saying that you may become effectual, your faith will become effectual, by the precise and correct knowledge of everything that's in you. So you're going to put it active by the precise, correct knowledge of everything that's in you as you're communicating your faith. Your faith is going to speak what and do what? the Word. That's how it's going to be active. That's how it's going to produce results in your life. That's why if we're not 
doing what the Word says and speaking it, our faith is not active and it will not bring forth the things that God purposes for us to obtain. Also, if we have the knowledge of the truth, we received it. Some people think, well, I've got the knowledge of truth, it doesn't matter what I do now, everything, you know, I'm, I'm okay, you know, I'm just doing my best now. They think that there won't be any problems. Oh no. Hebrews 10, 26. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, this precise correct knowledge, we've known it. There remains no more sacrifice for sins to get out of this situation. No, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation will devour the adversaries. That means judgments are going to come when we do things contrary to His word willfully. I mean, you don't walk in sin and think that you're not going to have some judgments or repercussions for it. Judge, sin is going to bring curses upon us. Sin is going to give place to the enemy so he can work against us. No, God wants us to walk in line with his word. What happened in Romans chapter 1? It talks about back here in verse 21. Because that when they knew God, these are people that knew God at some point, so they must have had the knowledge of God. They didn't glorify Him as God, and they, neither were they thankful. You are expected to glorify God in all that you do and be thankful unto Him. You never take God for granted. You're to be thankful and glorify Him, praise and worship Him, minister to Him. Now they became vain in their imaginations. What happened? Their foolish heart got darkened. Oh, they said we're wise. No, they became fools. They even changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man. How in the world could they do that? Because their mind wasn't, was not in the ways of the Lord. They got a reprobate mind came into them, as you'll see. God gave them up to the uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between them. They changed the truth of God into a lie. You can't be changing the word into a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature themselves more than the Creator. Who was Lord of their life? Themselves. Who is their God? Themself. And Jesus said, if any man come after me, deny himself. First off, crucify the flesh daily. Follow me. Now they got brought, given up to their vile affections. We see the homosexual actions here that it talks about these guys participating. They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. Theirs not in there in the Greek. They didn't like to retain, here this is a word which means to have really. They didn't like having God in precise correct knowledge. Because how do you have God in knowledge? Because he's a God of knowledge. Otherwise they kick the word out. What do you see happening all the time in the Old Testament? They're always throwing the, throwing the word, casting the law behind their back. He goes on and says, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That means a not approved mind to do those things that are not convenient. God will let you do what you want. He'll give you over to the wrong mind. It's not the will of God, but that's what happens. And they got filled with all these evil things, as it talks about. Doing all these evil things. That's what we see happen. These are even people that knew God. That's why we've got to walk in line with his word and do the things he says. Over in 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace. We want to see God's grace, his favor and peace come in our life. It's going to be multiplied unto you. How? Through or in the precise and correct knowledge of God. It's not, uh, grace is not automatic like some people teach out there. It's only going to come through the knowledge of God as you act on His Word. It's the Word of His grace that's going to build you up and give you your inheritance as you act upon it. See? And of Jesus our Lord, according as the divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge, the precise, correct knowledge of Him that's called us to glory and virtue. That's why we've got to get the knowledge of God. God's Word, His knowledge, gives us the power is the power of God resident in it to bring everything that you and I have need of for life and godliness. Everything that we have need of. And all these great promises that you and I are to possess through the knowledge of God. Hereby are exceeding 
whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Partakers of the divine nature. That means you're not a partaker of the divine nature until you possess the promises of God. If you're born again, that doesn't mean you're a partaker of the divine nature. You could be running around in the, in the lusts of the world, corruption through the lusts of the world and all its lusts. No. We're going to walk after the knowledge of God and possess the promises of God and do the things that He wants us to do. We even see down in verse 8 when He talks about these things being in you and abounding, and what He's talking about, go back, we can take a look at it. He talks about adding with all diligence, adding to your faith virtue and to virtue. Oh, virtue means moral excellence. Virtue knowledge, to that temperance, which is self-control, keeping the flesh under, and to that patience, which is steadfastness, and the steadfastness of godliness, respect towards God, brotherly kindness, and then charity, which is love, otherwise all these things that you're putting in operation in your life. If these things be in you and abound, they'll make you that you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge, the precise, correct knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be fruitful if you're doing these things, doing the Word. And he goes on and says, if you lack these things, we're blind, cannot see afar off, and even forgot that we are purged from our own sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election, which means selected or chosen, sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. God doesn't want us to fall. If we do the things that he says through the knowledge of God, that pertains everything for life and godliness, possess the promises. We won't be yielding to any of the things of the lust of this world and the corruption of the world through lust. No, we're going to walk in victory. Now suppose we've come out of some of these things. 2 Peter 2, verse 20 says, if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world, now we came out of the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge, the precise, correct knowledge of God, again, same word, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then they're again entangled there and they went back into it and overcome, or went back into this. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. You'll be worse. That's why we gotta follow the knowledge of God. We gotta follow the Word of God. You'll get worse. You can lose anything you've gained. The guy that got healed, Jesus said, Go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come on you. Anything that you've gained. The guy that got the demons cast, talks about casting out the demons. If they try to come back in, they'll come back with seven more wicked themselves. They'll stay the man, will be worse than the first. We can lose anything we've gained. That's why we're expected to walk in the knowledge of God. You can't offer up some sacrifice and get out of it, like it says. No, there's going to be a fearful looking for of judgment. Why is the knowledge of God so important? It shows the way of the Lord so we see God's blessings, His promises, His grace, His peace, all the things that He wants to bring forth, His power at work, walk in the way of righteousness, know Him, walk in fellowship, see everything that God wants come to pass in our life. What happens if we don't? We sin and we're going to give place to the enemy and destructive things are going to happen. This is why God wants us to get the knowledge of God. Look what it says in 2 Peter 3.18. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You grow in it. You grow in it through the Word of God. As you hear the Word of God, the, you get the knowledge of God, you're to grow in it, increase in it, as you hear it and do it and hear it and do it. Now, just because you've heard the Word doesn't mean it's staying in you all the time, remember, because Satan will come to try to take that Word out of your heart. And he will, if you don't do what it says. Remember the guy in the parable of the sower? He came to took the word out. Why did he take it out? Because he didn't understand it. How do you get spiritual understanding? By doing the word and keeping the word. That's why we gotta guard our heart. Because the devil comes to try to take it out of the midst of our heart. Because if it stays in your heart, it'll produce fruit. This is why we've got to grow in the grace and in the knowledge and continue in the knowledge of God and do what he says. That's why it's absolutely essential that you and I become doers of the Word of God. And what does God want to bring forth? He wants us to come to the place of developing a personal, intimate fellowship with Him. And that is so important. In fact, we even see 
1 John chapter 5, down here in verse 20. We know the Son of God has come, and He's given us an understanding here. This is a mind, where it means a mind is a faculty of understanding. That we may know Him that's true, and that we are in Him that's true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. That's what it's going to produce. Otherwise, God wants you to know Him. He wants you to know Him intimately. He wants you to know Him personally. He wants you to know His ways. He wants you to walk uprightly before Him precisely, accurately, correctly, according to the knowledge of God, so you can see God bring His promises to pass in your life. He will accomplish everything. He's a God of knowledge, and He will manifest Himself in you through the Word of God. Without the knowledge of God, we got problems. Or if we have doctrines of the devil or things that are contrary to the Word of God, we got problems as well. We need to be doing what the Word says. This is why we got to look up everything and study every scripture. For instance, example, Luke chapter 10, verse 19. The King James says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Well, that sounds like I, a power against the power of the enemy. Is that what it says in the Greek? No. We have to look everything up. The first word power is a Greek word, exousia. The second word, word for power in the, here is the word dunamis, if you see these below. The word exousia means authority. The word power, which is dunamis, truly means power. So this is saying you're to have authority over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now is that just an automatic fact? I have authority over all the power of the enemy. Nothing can hurt me. I just have to say that and nothing can hurt me just because I just believe that. No. How do we know? Because you've got to look up what it says. A lot of people make that statement as just an, a, a confession. Nothing can hurt me because I've got authority over all the power of the enemy. When you look up the word hurt, this is why we look up every word and show you the, vo the tense voice and mood. This word hurt is in a subjunctive mood. That is critical to understand in this verse. The mood of fact or reality in the Greek is called the indicative mood, used some 15,000 plus times in the Greek text. This word is a subjunctive mood that expresses things that are contrary to fact, that are conditional upon conditions being met. Otherwise, you've got to meet the conditions for this to happen. And what's the condition? that you use your authority to stop the power of the enemy, then nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's what it's literally saying in the Greek because it's showing the condition. Would you ever know that by just reading that without looking it up? You'd have no earthly idea. You'd just think that, well, that's just a truth, so I can just speak that and have that. I've had lots of people speak that. And I got beat up by the devil and I've been speaking that scripture. I wonder why it didn't work. Because that's not what it said. Well, it looked like it said that. We didn't look it up. See, that's why we got to look up everything and find out exactly what it says. Then, as we do the word, we will walk in victory. Knowledge. We've got to have knowledge. That's what I learned. I learned this 30-some years ago. And I learned, God said, look up every word. He said, don't assume anything's right, translated right. Look up every word, and also you better learn the Greek the Bible school I went to didn't have Greek as a course. A lot of them have options and stuff, but they don't really emphasize it. But there was a guy who came from a place and they had, well, if you want it's elective type of thing, you can take this Greek course. Me and two other people, the only ones that showed up for the course, they had to do it after hours, but I said, I want that. And I knew that I needed to learn that, so I started to learn the Greek. And I started taking Greek courses on my own as well and started learning and studying that way back then. It's essential. Without it, you're going to be in the dark. We've got to get the knowledge of God. Because what was the New Testament written in? It's written in Greek. And the English translations are translated from the Greek. So you've got to look in the original of what it is to find out what it really says and see whether it's translated correctly. It's amazing. That's all we have to do, find out what the Word says. Get the knowledge of God and we'll know exactly what it says. And that's what God wants. 
it is imperative that you and I get the knowledge of God. So what do we need to do? We've got to study the Word. We've got to spend time in the Word. We've got to take that Word and do that Word so the devil doesn't take it out. We're going to study and look at what the Scriptures say. We're going to apply it. Be a doer of that Word. We're going to get full of knowledge, and we're going to walk in it. It's the power of God that will produce every promise in our life. It's absolutely essential. If you're going to grow up as a Christian, you're going to get the Word in you. You're going to get the knowledge of God in you. You're going to learn the ways of the Lord, and you're going to walk in it, and you're going to see the fruit of it. That's how God knows us. He knows us by our fruits. Well, what's the fruit evident from? What's the fruit result from? From the Word working in you. If you don't have the knowledge of God doing the Word, do you have any fruit? No. If you don't have any fruit, then there's a problem. That shows we're not getting the knowledge of God and walking in His ways. Say this to me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your Word that reveals the importance of the knowledge of God. You're a God of knowledge, and you want me to have knowledge. I realized that people were destroyed for a lack of knowledge and went into captivity because of no knowledge. I'm going to seek after knowledge, spending time in your word. I'm going to hear your word. I'm going to study your word. I'm going to apply your word, doing what it says. And as I take hold of the word and do what you say, I will see the results from the knowledge of God, bringing forth promises, bringing forth deliverance, healing, victory, freedom in my life, liberty. I thank you, Lord. I'm going to do what your word says. I'm going to speak what your word says. I realize that wisdom and knowledge will be the stability in my life. I'm not going to let myself be looked at as a foolish person by the Lord because I don't have the knowledge of God or I've got wrong knowledge that's contrary to the truth. I'm going to get the knowledge of God. Exact, precise, correct knowledge by studying the Word and seeing exactly what it says. And I'm going to do that Word. I'm going to get full of knowledge. And I will also guard myself. I will cast down every thought that's contrary to the knowledge of God. I will not let the devil have place in my mind to sow things contrary to the Word. I am going to put my faith in operation as I do what the Word says. And I'm going to guard myself from every, any doctrines of the devil by checking everything out in line with the Word to see if it's the truth. Thank you, Father. I also understand if I sin willfully after getting knowledge of the truth, judgment's going to come. I have the fear of God before me so I don't walk in sin. I'm walking after the knowledge of God. I'm going to grow in knowledge. And I know as I walk in your ways, I'm going to develop a personal intimate fellowship with you. I'm going to know you. I'm going to know your ways. I'm going to see your promises coming to pass in my life. Thank you, Lord. I am going to get the precise, correct, accurate knowledge of God in me through the Word. And I'm going to do it, and I'm going to see the fruit of it. I'll see the promises come to pass. I'll see all your blessings come forth in my life. And I will develop a personal, intimate fellowship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. So important. Knowledge of God. Without it, we're in the dark. I was in the dark when I was first growing up as a Christian because I'd hear what everybody else said. But I didn't study. I didn't look things up. I didn't find out whether it was the truth. Then when I started learning about studying, and I started finding out, oh, this is contrary to the Word. 
Why did they say that? That's not right. And I began to see, I had to unlearn a lot of things. And then when I went to Bible school, I heard a lot of things. But I still wasn't quite there on studying yet. But after all, when I got, when I was the, at the end of the Bible school, I started learning the Greek and started learning all these things. God got a hold of me. That's when he told me, you're going to study and approach every subject as if you know nothing. When I started seeing the errors here and there, because I don't want to make any mistakes. Will the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us into all truth? Yes. How's he going to do it? If we do due diligence to do what we need to do. If we'll just do what he says, we'll rightly divide the word of truth. But that means we're going to have to spend the time and look at every scripture. And the key is, you've got to approach every subject if you know nothing. If you approach it through your own thinking, own reasoning, own belief system, you're shutting yourself off from receiving truth. If you believe every scripture, and you, know, and you believe and act upon that, you're going to see revelation come forth. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. That's how I learned so many different things. People say, well, where did you learn all this, and where where'd you get some of these things? You teach things different from other people. I said, it's just the Word. You just have to teach the Word. It's the Word's the truth. And if you don't see, the, see it in the Word, you know there's a problem. So this is important for you. That's why, you know, I endeavor here that I'm always going to teach you Scripture after Scripture, point after point, and always look up every single thing so I'm responsible to do what's right. That's my responsibility. Because if a little blind leads the blind, they both fall in the ditch, and I'll be responsible, you know. And so we want to be sure it's the right thing. So praise God. You, got, of course, have a responsibility to check everything out, to be sure it's in line with the Scripture, to study everything out, and to put it in operation in your life. And as you're a doer of the Word, then you're going to see great blessings and fruit come forth in your life. Father, we thank you and praise you for all you brought forth. Thank you for the knowledge of God, and we see the importance of it. We see it's essential. We are going to get the knowledge of God, and we're going to be sure we get the accurate, precise, correct knowledge of God by studying your word and believing every scripture and not being prejudiced by preconceived beliefs or notions. Instead, we will know that your word is the truth because it's in line with it. Thank you, Father. We're going to do what you say and get filled with the knowledge of God. And we are going to develop that personal, intimate fellowship with you. Thank you for accomplishing this in our life as we're a doer of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. If you need prayer before we conclude, I invite you to come forward. Glad to pray for you in any area. And if you need healing or need deliverance, any areas, prayer for some agreement in some area, we want to invite you to come forward. We want to pray for the needs in your life. God bless. We're going to continue to talk to you tonight in the 630 service on the subject of knowing God. We've got a lot of things to share. And we're also going to be talking later about understanding and wisdom as God wants us to have all these things established in us. That is what it says. Get wisdom, get understanding, get knowledge. We see that continually through the Word. When you get that, you're going to know God and walk in His ways and walk in victory. God bless. You're dismissed. Need prayer? Come forward. Have a great afternoon. 630 service tonight. We'll continue on. Fine, how are you? How are you doing? Praise God. Good. Let yourself.